This is the Moonlight Graham Show, a freewheeling conversation with the role players, the underdogs, and guys with flat out great stories in sports. Hello and welcome back to the Moonlight Graham Show. Once again, I'm your host, Tim Flattery, and our Moonlighter for today is the author of The Cup of Coffee Club, 11 Players and Their Brush with Baseball History. So we've talked about this before on the podcast, that a player that has a really short career in the major leagues, it is said that he had a cup of coffee in the major leagues. And so you could say that about Moonlight Graham. Actually, Moonlight Graham is probably the most famous cup of coffee guy ever in baseball history because he played in one major league game and famously during that game moonlight graham never got in that bat so what jacob kornhauser the author of this cup of coffee club book what he has done is he has taken a look through baseball history and there's close to a thousand guys in baseball history that their major league career only lasted one game and jacob kornhauser he's went back to these close to a thousand guys he's found the 11 best stories that he could tell in this book and he wrote wrote a book about each one of these 11 guys experiences in their one game their one day in the major leagues and it's just such a fantastic book i've always thought that stories like this are what make baseball great because you can have one guy that comes up late in the year that has a great outing on the mound for your favorite team in the middle of a pennant race or a young star that gets called up has a great day hits a home run in his first at bat but then gets injured has to go through a couple of years of rehab and never gets back to the major league. Baseball is full of stories like this, and that's what Jacob Kornheiser is doing with this Cup of Coffee Club book. It's a fantastic book. I've read it, and I thought it would be perfect to get him on the podcast because the entire intro of the book is all about Moonlight Graham. So there's so many tie-ins to what we're doing here on the podcast, and it was fun to get Jacob here on the show and to talk about his book, his views on baseball, and some of the best untold underdog stories in the game and I think you guys are really going to enjoy this episode and if you like what we're doing here on the podcast make sure to subscribe to the Moonlight Graham show wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also follow the show on social media Twitter Instagram Facebook YouTube we love hearing from you guys each and every week so enjoy today's episode with Moonlighter Jacob Kornhauser the author of the cup of coffee club 11 players and their brush with baseball history But before we get to our episode, I want to talk to you about a new partner of ours. It's called the Underdog Newsletter. So the Underdog Newsletter is an email newsletter that you can sign up for online. Here's what it is. It's a bite-sized rundown of the best underdog stories in sports. You guys know we're all about the underdogs here on the Moonlight Graham Show. And what these guys do, they sift through thousands of stories each and every week and handpick the best underdog stories and deliver them into your email inbox each and every week. They deliver it the same time the Moonlight Graham Show comes out every Tuesday morning. And these guys over at the Underdog Newsletter, they celebrate the long shots, the rejects, the misfits, beating the odds and overcoming adversity. I don't know if there's a better email subscription list that you can sign up for than the Underdog Newsletter. Here's how you find them. You head over to www.jokermag.com backslash newsletter. Or to make it even easier, all you have to do is type in Underdog Newsletter into Google, sign up for the Underdog Newsletter. It'll come into your inbox every Tuesday morning and let them know the Moonlight Graham Show sent you. I guarantee that you'll enjoy this underdog newsletter each and every week. Check them out, guys. I am here with Jacob Kornheiser. Jacob, the author of, let me get this this right, The Cup of Coffee Club. And of course, if you're a baseball fan, you know a cup of coffee in, in baseball means you had a short, brief stint in the major leagues. Jacob, where did you get the idea for this book? Yeah, near the end uh, of my collegiate career, actually, one of my colleagues and, and buddies of mine were both big baseball fans. We were kind of just chatting about kind of baseball oddities, stuff like that. Um, and then I just posed the question like, huh, I wonder how many players have, have only played one game. I didn't know how common it was or anything like that. So then we kind of shared a look like, oh, you know, you might be onto something. So I started looking it up to see, um, how common it was, found out that kind of back in the day, it wasn't all that uncommon, but in the last 
50 years or so, it, there haven't been that many guys um, who have played in only one game, only about uh, 150 or so in the last 50 years. So um, from there, I kind of knew that I was in that sweet spot of there were enough guys to write some cool stories about, but not so many guys that it wasn't this unique thing or this unique club that these guys were a member of. Um, and I'd always wanted to write a baseball book, was always kind of looking for something to write about, but never had something that had so much breadth to it uh, to be able to put something together. But as soon as I got cracking on this, I, I knew that I had something. Yeah, so you mentioned it's not as common today. And obviously, we're called the Moonlight Graham Show. You talk about Moonlight right. Graham in your intro. You mentioned him a couple of times throughout the book as well. So are you telling me that the Moonlight Graham story, where guys just played in one game, was more common back in Moonlight Graham's day than it is today? Yeah, so there have been roughly a 1,000 uh, Cup of Coffee Club players overall over the years, and obviously – uh, you can do the math, you know, if, if we've had 150 or so in the last 50 years uh, in early baseball, there were a lot more. Um, and so there were, you know, six, seven, eight, nine a, a season back then, whereas now we maybe see three a year. Um, so it was a little more common just because, you know, the, the league wasn't as established yet. Guys were kind of moving in and out. It wasn't as organized. And so, you know, one of the older stories um, kind of at the end of the book uh, about the 1912 Tigers, where they had a bunch of guys have their only appearance you know a bunch of college guys from philadelphia you saw more stuff like that where you know a guy might sub in and yet he didn't have necessarily a record of minor league experience or anything like that so i think that's why we saw earlier on in baseball that uh, it was more common than now I was just fascinated by this book, um, especially since, you know, Moonlight Graham with with our show. But right when this came out and actually it was released on my birthday, just another tie in between you and I. Oh. Here. And wow. everybody was tagging me in it right away as soon as it got released. And I thought that was, was so <laughs> neat. But out of all your research and maybe the thousand players that that have, you know, are part of this cup of coffee club, cup of coffee club. Who had the best one day in the big leagues? I'd have to go with John Pachorek. I think he's the kind of quintessential go-to um, person in terms of like who had the best day at the plate. Um, he went three for three and also walked twice, so he reached all five times uh, at bat. Uh, he played for the, the old Colt 45s uh, against the very lowly Mets, um, so it's kind of hard to tell, you know, how. and it was at the end of the season, last game of the year or so. It's hard to tell if he would have been able to sustain that. You know, he got injured uh, the pre the spring afterward, um, and so he never got back, and that's why he only got one game. Um, but he's kind of the, the commonly held best hitter performance. Um, I think it would be a little harder to parse through the pitchers, but one that comes to mind is Chris Sines, who he pitched for the Brewers. Um, there was an injury. I believe Chris Capuano went down. Uh, and so he got a spot start for the Brewers, pitched six and a third innings, uh, didn't give up any runs against the Cardinals, uh, who were pretty good that year. And then he never got back. You know, he uh, busted his elbow. And so, again, injuries kind of keep at him from getting a second chance. So I think hitter and pitcher, those would be the two that I'd go with. Yeah, I've read that. You mentioned Chris Sines in the intro to your book, and I was a little surprised right. he didn't have his own chapter. Was he a guy that you tried to get in touch with but weren't able to, or, or why did you eliminate Chris from uh, from the book? Yeah, exactly. He was harder to get a hold of, I guess, than the other guys. And then once we got down the line of kind of setting up interviews and everything, uh, you know, his representatives and kind of the people I reached out to um, didn't didn't really express any interest in doing the book. So if I do, you know, a second volume or something, which is certainly something on the table that I might do down the line, if I can find a way to make it a little different from this one, um, then I'll reach back out and hopefully, uh, you know, be able to flesh out his full story more than just, you know, his stat line on his one game. When you're talking to these guys, you know, so many of them, uh, it's kind of heartbreaking. Like Chris Sines, we talk about, you know, he might have had a great career ahead of him if he doesn't get hurt. And, you know, some right. of these other guys, it's injuries that derail their career, like Larry Yount, Robin Yount's older brother. He, you know, he took himself out of the game as he's warming up, so he actually never even got into a game, but he's credited with one MLB right. appearance because he was announced by the announcer. So as, in a, as I'm reading some of these stories, my heart is breaking, similar to how my heart breaks for Moonlight Graham. And as you're doing those interviews, did you ever find yourself just kind of like getting, I don't know, sad about it all yeah it's almost one of those things where 
it's this revisionist history sort of thing that you wish in these guys telling their stories as you're going through it, you just wish you could go back and, you know, change one or two things that might have enabled them to have a few years at least uh, in the big leagues. In some of their cases, maybe even more than that. Um, so I think that was the hardest thing in terms of just like hearing their stories and kind of thinking, you know, one thing here, one thing there changes uh, and, and maybe they get more years in the major leagues. On the flip side of that, though, so few guys do get to play in the major leagues. And of course, the, the one game makes it sort of this bittersweet thing to look back on for all these guys. But at the same time, everything happened the way it did, and they still did get to play in the major leagues. They get to tell everyone, you know, they played in the big leagues, which obviously the ultimate goal of kind of what they had worked for their whole lives. So that's really the dynamic at play in asking these guys how they look back on their careers. You know, it's on this sort of bittersweet spectrum. Um, and I actually found that the guys, by and large, uh, at least have their own chapters devoted to them, uh, actually were further on to the sweet side than the bitter side, which I thought it was going to be the other way around when I started the project. It's interesting because, you know, time heals all wounds. And so it really depends on, you know, when are you speaking to these guys as how they're right. viewing their career and how their career went. Like when you look up a guy like Stephen Larkin, who is another Hall of Fame brother and Barry Larkin, you know, he got called up to the bigs, I think in 1998, but then he mm -hmm. went on to play like seven more years of minor league baseball right. after that. And I'm always wondering about guys like that when they get the call up pretty early in their career, but then they still have like, you know, this minor league career after it where it's everything, you know, similar to Crash Davis. Everything compared to right. your day in the major league sucks uh, in comparison. <laughs> and you're always thinking like, I got to get back. I got to get back. I got to get yep. back. Yeah, I think it adds to that psychological aspect of everything because you think about it, these guys have sort of theoretically climbed this mountain once and then they're sent back down and, you know, they've got to climb it again. And for some of the, the more talented players who it's pretty obvious they're going to be in the, the big league, maybe that doesn't affect them because of their confidence, because of their talent level. Um, but obviously, by nature, all of the Cup of Coffee Club players, or at least almost all of them, uh, are kind of these fringe major leaguers, you know, guys that can carve out a nice career for themselves if everything goes right five, six, seven years in the big league, or some of them could, could never get called up. So I think knowing that you're that type of player, which I, most of the players I spoke with kind of acknowledge that they, they realize that, you know, they, and none of these guys were star can't miss prospects. Um, it's sort of this thing that you've got to climb the mountain a second time. And I think in looking at their stats, if you look at what numbers they put up after they got called back down, got sent back down to the minor leagues, most of them really struggled. And I, I wonder if some of that isn't psychological. And most of them, you know, acknowledge that certainly played a big role. Now, I've seen that you've worked with Tim Kirchin, the famous baseball statistician. <laughs> What's yes. Tim Kirchin like in person? Uh, he is the nicest guy. He's kind of like almost what you'd expect him to be um, just from watching him on TV and everything. You know, he's super authentic. Um, you know, I worked there uh, – going on four years ago now, I guess. Um, but he and I stay in contact and I kind of picked his brain when I was first starting to organize, you know, how to put this book together. Obviously he's written a few um, and is a great reporter and storyteller and kind of just picking his brain of, of how to tell these stories. So yeah, in person, he uh, is very giving with his time for someone kind of of his stature and, and wants to give back to kind of younger writers. So it's great to have a mentor of, of both his stature and talent and, and of his kindness as well. When you're talking with Tim Kirchin, just off of the record, you know, two friends hashing it out, two colleagues hashing it out. Is he still right. the stats guy that you see on TV? Because he seems to me like a guy oh, that just yeah. can't turn it off. <laughs> yeah, even if it's not specific stats, you know, he'll he'll tell stories of Earl Weaver or, you know, a bunch of, of different Orioles history because, of course, that's how he got his start um, in Baltimore. And so even if it's not, you know, some crazy stat or something like that, you know, he'll just pull stories out of his back pocket. And it, it's crazy to me, obviously, not having that lived experience yet of, of being able to tell all these stories and being around all these big league clubhouses and to just have, you know, any story on deck that kind of applies to any situation is, is pretty mind boggling. Who's your team? The Cubs. I grew up in the uh, Chicago suburbs. Oh, nice. Where were you with the Bartman play? Uh, I cried myself to sleep in about second grade when <laughs> it happened. Um, I don't really know how I grasped the significance of it. I don't think I fully even grasped the significance of it. I knew that they would go to the World Series if they had won that game, but I still, looking back on it, 
I'm kind of happy that everything played out the way it did because they ended up winning the World Series when I was a senior in college. I was able to take some time off and go back to Chicago from the zoo uh, where I was in school. And so that was, I guess, in hindsight, I'm fine with it. And I also don't like blame him at all at the time. I'm sure I did, like everyone did, just kind of being reactionary and everything like that. Uh, but I think telling his story would be one of the great stories to be able to tell, you know, if he's if he's ever willing to tell it. Yeah, has he resurfaced anywhere? No, not that I've seen. I know that some reporters have tried to contact him, tried to interview him, and he kind of just politely declines, even if they end up like tracking him down in person or whatever. I think uh, the Catching Hell 30 for 30, they tracked him down, um, and then he just said basically he didn't want to be interviewed, didn't want to talk. So uh, he's still very reluctant, and, you know, that was what, 17, almost 17 years ago now, so that's pretty crazy. You know, he's lived a lot of his – a lot of his life after that. So it is interesting and it'll be interesting to see if, if he's ever willing to tell his story, if he ever kind of feels like he can come back into the public light. Who was your favorite player growing up then? Uh, Derek Lee. He Ooh, was, uh, he yeah. was a guy that, you know, he was, he was on that Marlins team actually during the Bartman game, which kind of makes it interesting, but then came to the Cubs the next year. So he was kind of their best player while I was in those formative years of baseball when you're like really, really, uh, passionate and into baseball, playing it, talking about it, writing about it, watching it nonstop. Um, so he, he definitely was number one, you know, him and Aramis Ramirez kind of be in the, the middle of that order um, when they were winning division titles in 07 and 08. So I actually, then I got to, to meet him uh, at Cubs convention one year. I believe I was a freshman in high school. Um, and so he was kind of toward the end of his Cubs tenure, but he was a super nice guy uh, when I got to meet him, uh, get his autograph and everything. So it was nice to, to meet him and, you know, not have him kind of blow me off or, or something like that. You know, they say don't meet your heroes, but it was it was nice to you know shake his hand and thank him for, you know, all those home runs that he hit in the Cubs uniform. Yeah, I mean, Derek Lee, he had some monster years for the Cubs there. He was taking a run at the Triple Crown at one point. Yeah. You know, he just one of those awesome guys, but it, it was in those kind of forgotten Cubs. I, I shouldn't say they're forgotten Cubs years, but they always ended with disappointment. And and he's not right. like looked at as legendary, maybe as like your Sammy Sosa's, Mark Grace, right. uh, Ryan Sandberg, Ernie Banks, Billy Williams. You know, but he's just the next level kind of under those guys. Right. Yeah, I think I saw a stat the other day that said in 2005, Derek Lee hit. 40 or more homers, 50 or more doubles, and had 15 or more steals. And that was the only time in, in Major League history that that had happened. Um, so that was pretty crazy. I didn't, I didn't even remember uh, that he was a decent base dealer uh, back then as well. I think he struggled in the postseason in 07 and 08 uh, when the Cubs got there because, of course, they didn't win a game in either of those series. Um, so if he had been able to step up more along with some of his teammates, you know, maybe he would be more front of mind when we're thinking of, of great Cubs. What was your favorite day in Wrigley then? Well, I was in Wrigleyville. Obviously, the Game 7 of the 2016 World Series was in Cleveland, but I was in Wrigleyville. Uh, I have a, a really good kind of childhood friend who lives around that area now, and we went to a bar in Wrigleyville. So I guess my best day in Wrigleyville was that day, of course, when they won the World Series and everyone was, you know, uh, celebrating in the streets and everything. In terms of a day at Wrigley... I wasn't ever at any like crazy games, but I do. Some of my best memories are the sort of like hecklers uh, in the crowd, whether it be uh, in the in the bleachers, usually in the bleachers and stuff like that. So there was one. Um, I'm trying to remember. I think one time they played the Reds and Corky Miller. Uh, oh, was I love the Corky catcher Miller for the Reds. And so every time he either came up or he did anything. Uh, some random dude in the stands, and I was probably, you know, nine or ten years old at the time, some random guy in the stands would just yell, Corky, over and over and over again. So it was, like, stuck in my head for a long time. (laughs) It, like, stuck with me. So I think just those random moments, um, I'm sick with you. I will say my worst moment at Wrigley, uh, I was supposed to go on an East Coast kind of baseball road trip over one of my college summers, And my buddy that I was going to go with was driving up from St. Louis uh, and his car broke down. So we had to cancel this whole trip. Felt really bad. So I ended up going to a Cubs Cardinals game with my brother to kind of try to feel better about it. Uh, And then the Cubs blew a lead. Uh, I think Johnny Peralta hit like a two run homer uh, to flip the Cubs from being up one to down one in the ninth. And we were in the bleachers. The home run ball landed like 10 feet away from us. So (laughs) 
That was uh, that was very bad. It made it even worse that that trip got canceled. <laughs> I tried to go to a Cubs Cardinals game to feel better, and uh, it did not work. I've always wondered what's with the no the no wave at Wrigley thing. I don't know. I mean, I personally don't love the wave. Um, I don't love the wave hard, either. I, I just feel yeah. like like the bleacher creatures are pretty militaristic about the no wave thing. Yeah. I, well, I think part of it is probably that the bleachers are like a separate entity from the field. You know, you can't like go back and forth like yeah. you could at other ballparks where you just like the bleachers are kind of their own thing and you can't uh, move into the other side. So maybe that like physical or even unspoken barrier plays into it in terms of like the wave seems weird if it was continuing there. I don't know. I don't know what like social dynamics are at play, but. Um, I know every now and then a beach ball might find its way out there or something, but yeah, I guess I didn't even realize that the wave is not very prevalent in the bleachers. Well, yeah, and they they always have signs like "No wave in the bleachers." I, every time <laughs> I've sat in the bleachers, I've seen it out there, and I'm like, I've always thought I'm not a big fan of the wave, but I'm also not going to bring a sign right. into the stadium to yell at yeah. people for having the wave. Yeah, you think with all the drinking that's going on in the bleachers that they'd be more down for it, but I guess not. Being that you're a Midwestern guy from Illinois, you grew up not too far from the Field of Dreams. Have you ever been to the Field of Dreams, Jacob? Correct. I have not. And what? I'm very disappointed because for my – so I work at Fox Sports now, uh, and I was hoping to be able to go and cover the Field of Dreams game happening, uh, but I think obviously with the pandemic we're cutting down uh, on the number of people that are going to get to go. So I'm very disappointed in that because that would have been my, my first trip to the area. Do you have it on your list of, you know, getting to the Field of Dreams? Like, where does that sit on your bucket list of baseball things that you need to do? Yeah, I mean, it's right there with kind of visiting all the, the stadiums because I've been to 24 now. Um, and obviously this year, this year I was going to go to Seattle and San Diego. Uh, but again, I think that's going to be delayed by a year or so. Yeah. Um, but it's right in with that because, you know, I've been to Cooperstown, um, done some other kind of baseball related things and been to most of the ballparks. Um, and I was actually going to go to the field of dreams. Uh, I have a buddy, one of my roommates from college, uh, is from Cedar Rapids. So we went after, I believe our freshman year and stayed with him and we were going to go to the field of dreams. And for some reason that trip got canceled. I don't remember why actually. Um, so I should have gone like, you know, five, six years ago. Uh, but it wasn't to be, but you know, like you said, I live so close that, uh, once things are open back up and everything, when when I'm home, I'll I'll probably be able to get down there. You've mentioned you went to Mizzou a couple of times, and I didn't look this up prior. But who's the best baseball player ever to go to Mizzou? Uh, got to be Max Scherzer. Oh yeah, of course. I, I didn't even think of yeah, Scherzer. Him, uh, Ian Kinsler, uh, and those those two are right up there. You know, it seems like they, even though as a Team, they're never really that good. They tend to churn out, you know, decent individual players. Um, so yeah, Scherzer. I always say like Scherzer must be um, the highest earning Mizzou athlete ever, and probably only to Brad Pitt, the highest earning Mizzou grad in you know ever. Because Brad Pitt uh, dropped out of Mizzou like six weeks before graduation <laughs> to take some role in Hollywood, and I guess it worked out okay for him. Did Phil Bradley was he a name? Uh, that people still talk about at Mizzou? Not that I heard too much. You know, I know that in kind of the, the baseball landscape was changing when I went there, obviously, because Mizzou had just joined the SEC. So SEC baseball is kind of this next tier, kind of like with football. It's it's uh, kind of on its own level. So they were playing all these teams. That was That was the fun thing about going to Mizzou baseball games. You know, you got to see – the Dansby Swansons of the world and kind of an Alex Bregman, these SEC hitters who you knew were destined for the big league. Even if Mizzou was getting crushed, you knew that you were seeing kind of this next crop uh, of MLB talent. Yeah, it's cool. Well, Jacob, the way we end every episode of the Moonlight Graham show is with the five big questions. And so the first <laughs> question is name one player that is hall of fame eligible, but, but not in the hall of fame that if you had the magic pen, you would put them in the hall of fame right now. Well, I guess that technically eliminates Pete Rose because he's not technically eligible. I don't know that I'd go with him anyway. One that I would say just because it's a kind of unknown or crazy story would be Dave Steve. He isn't by the numbers. He is like very borderline, if not probably right outside Hall of Fame numbers. Uh, but he had in a two-year stretch – 
he should have had four no hitters, including one perfect game. And he lost three of them with two outs in the ninth inning. And so had he completed all of those, just gotten that last out in all those games, and he has four no hitters and a perfect game, not to mention, you know, one of the best pitchers of the 90s, I have a hard time believing that he wouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. And yeah, it really hurt Dave Steve that he played in Toronto. Like, yep. if he was in the same in the AL Central, you know, in, with Boston or New York, that guy's in the Hall of Fame just with his career as it stands. Absolutely, yeah, because he was. I mean, he was dominant, um, and I think a lot of people don't really realize how dominant he was. You know, he was a, a clear top ten pitcher of the '90s. Unfortunately, almost his entire peak came there. And actually, in the '80s, it, it was kind of a, I guess, decade long stretch not necessarily the 90s but kind of mid 80s to to early to mid 90s was his peak if you could go back in time to one game in baseball history what game are you going to i'll say when jackie robinson broke the color barrier just to see everything because to me that's kind of the most significant moment in baseball history just for everything that ushered in and afterward i think it would be interesting to see how everything played out, kind of take everything in and um, witness a historic moment like that. And even, you know, if nothing in the game outside of that seemed super thrilling, like it would be for, you know, a bit of the Babe Ruth called shot or something like that. I think just being able to witness and put yourself in that place would be really cool. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I just saw a stat the other day that had something like, you know, 8% of Major League Baseball players are African-American um, which is really low, and especially since Jackie yep. Robinson broke the color barrier, you know, not that long ago. In the in hindsight of things, and and baseball was the premier sport. Uh, Jackie Robinson mm-hmm. played baseball in integrated sports, essentially, and yet we still don't have very many African American players in the game today. You know, in the seventies and eighties, I think we had a we had a peak of them, and the game was really great and athletic. Right. But I think the game is definitely um, experiencing a lag in that right now, and I wonder if. You know, if baseball was more popular among the African-American community, if we'd have, you know, what the game would look like, right? If we had guys like Drew Holiday and Zach Levine right. and guys like this playing, because back in the day, you'd have like Lou Brock, Fergie Jenkins, Bob Gibson, like those guys all played yeah. on the Glo- Globetrotters, but but the money <laughs> and the fame was in baseball, even though they were awesome basketball right. players. And what if, if, if that... F- it was the same today. And you had a lot of these great basketball players who are the, some of the best athletes in the world playing baseball. Right. Yeah. I think in the seventies, it peaked at about like double what it is now, you know, 17, 18, 19%, um, which really, you know, it is just hurting to see how low it is now. And I think a number of factors obviously play in, uh, in terms of access, um, and stuff like that. And just, um, being able to, Start, but obviously baseball also is kind of you know an older person's game. It's not as uh, kind of cool, and I think you see that in soccer as well. That's why they, the U.S. struggles so much to recruit soccer talent because they haven't made it to where your best athletes are playing soccer. That's how it is in almost the rest of the world uh, to where your best athletes are playing soccer, and that's why they're so dominant. So if baseball can find a way, you know, to reach out to communities of color and and make sure that. Uh, kind of from day one or from the start, you know, in childhood that, that baseball is a sport that's worth considering and, and worth playing, uh, then I think hopefully, you know, in our lifetimes or the next you know, 15, 20 years, we'll see an improvement in that. Yeah, it is interesting because baseball is a very diverse sport. It just has not been able to capture the African-American community over the last 20 or 30 years because you look at every exactly. baseball team, there's lots of people of color on it. They're just not necessarily right. African-Americans. Right. But okay, that leads me to my next question. You know, I think you and I both care passionately about baseball and baseball has made for in ruining the popularity of the game here in America. So what do you think yeah. is maybe the most important thing that baseball can do to grow the game and to kind of save it from the direction that it's going? Well, I think the first thing would be having a commissioner that doesn't implement things that takes away like it seems like everything that Rob Manfred does every solution he has for the game is to like shorten games uh take away aspects of the game uh so I think things like that are reductive by nature and there needs to be some type of you know addition that makes things more interesting not 
trying to shorten games. Like, I don't think anyone is going to just jump in and watch baseball because the average game length is 12 minutes shorter on average. <laughs> right. um, so I think that's, that's pretty misguided um, from the commissioner's office. But really, and I think most people would point to this, is just marketing their stars correctly. Like, look at the NBA, and it's like a superstar league. And I don't know if it's owners having trepidation about their players becoming, you know, bigger than the team, quote unquote, or stuff like that. Whereas the NBA handles it really well. Um, Adam Silver, the commissioner handles it really well in terms of kind of it being more of a collective where I feel like baseball is still uh, more resistant to stuff like that. Uh, but if they want to grow the game and have a long-term vision, which I'm not sure they do based on, you know, their tactics that they tried pulling during negotiations uh, a few months ago, uh, but if they have a long-term vision, they really do need to market these superstars because then that's how you establish those pipelines. And kind of the fact that we have so many interesting and talented young players in the game right now, like marketing that and kind of their excitement. Um, and even if it breaks some of the quote unquote unwritten rules of baseball that used to exist, you know, in terms of not showing up the pitcher and stuff like that, I think baseball needs to embrace that. And until they do, it's not going to be looked at as a cool sport. They're, average fan age i believe is in the like mid 50s uh so if they don't change uh, i don't see the popularity getting better but the first thing uh, i would do is kind of you know hire some firm that has uh experience in that area and try to market their superstars a lot better yeah i, I agree with that statement so as a guy that you know, you've been around baseball, you've written this book, you're in the media. I'm sure you've encountered a lot of cool people and have able to gather some really cool sports memorabilia, whether it's baseball or not, throughout your, your career right. so far. What's your most treasured piece of sports memorabilia? Hmm, that's a good one. Um, I don't have anything that's like crazy, uh, like off the, you know, something that would be nuts to people. But I think one that I hold close to me is that uh, for my first birthday, uh, I got a, I think my aunt knew like a groundskeeper at Wrigley or something like that. I don't know. It was a weird story, but um, I got a, a signed baseball from Mark Grace that says like, happy first birthday, Jacob. And, um, you know, the signature and it's got in the case with kind of a, a plaque and everything. So I think that's pretty cool. Cause you know, obviously he was uh, one of the best players uh, on the Cubs in the nineties. And so, um, having more of a, a personalized sort of thing is, is pretty cool. That is really nice. I like that. You know, didn't Mark Grace lead the majors in hits in the 90s? Wasn't that a stat? He did. Yeah, yeah, he led the, the majors in hits in the 90s, which is crazy. He's another guy um, that, you know, most of his peak was actually right in one decade. So um, he sort of gets forgotten. You know, obviously he's had off-field issues since then, um, which has helped him kind of fade uh, from the public light, but he in the nineties was, was one of the best hitters, at least in terms of putting the bat on the ball, getting on base. Final question here, Jacob, what is the best advice you've ever received? I think in terms of writing and kind of just reporting in general, you know, it's a pretty competitive business and you tend to compare yourselves, uh, to other people. Um, and I think the best advice I got, um, was kind of an upperclassman, um, when I was in college and just kind of giving the advice of, you're basically trying to improve and one up yourself, not other people, like not focusing on kind of what other people are doing, you know, in your field or, or whatever it may be. And that's been really useful advice kind of in my career and in my life in terms of, you know, if you are able to assess where you are in any particular area, then you can kind of build on that. But if you start comparing yourself to other people, um, then it kind of just breaks down because it leads to anxiety, jealousy, wh whatever it may be. And then you're not really, I guess, trying to improve for the right reasons. So I think that piece of advice, especially at such a formative time, you know, as I was pushing toward graduation and getting a first job and everything, um, that was, that was really important. That's great advice. Essentially that, that captures social media right there. The, the problem with social yeah. media is the anti of that advice. Exactly. Well, Jacob, thank you so much for joining us here on the Moonlight Graham Show. The author of the Cup of Coffee Club, Jacob, how can how can everybody get in touch with you, buy your book, and follow you? Yeah, so Twitter is where I'm most active. Uh, you can follow me there uh, at Corn Sports, but it's K O R N Sports, um, and then you can find the book on Amazon, uh, Indie Bound. You know, if you want to help independent bookstores during the pandemic, of course. Uh, barnesandnoble.com really if you just any anywhere you get your books if you search it uh, you should hopefully 
uh, be able to find it. And then I want to give a quick plug to uh, the Pandemic Baseball Book Club, which oh, is yeah. kind of this club of authors um, that have all come together during this pandemic um, and trying to kind of help each other um, promote our books, which is very unique. But with you know all of us having uh, stuff canceled during the pandemic in terms of being able to promote the book, we're all kind of leaning on each other. So uh, pbcbaseball.com, uh, you can see you know basically all the new baseball titles um, that have come out in the last you know three, four, five months, um, and you can order any of those books there too. So um, definitely want to get other authors um, of some of the the great baseball books that have come out in the last few months uh, some love as well. Absolutely. I just started following them on Twitter uh, because I signed up for a giveaway. I was hoping to get a free book out of the deal. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) that giveaway will be awesome. I think all the details will be released shortly, but it's a a huge, huge giveaway. So hopefully people enter that uh, and we get lots of entries. So cool. Well, thank you, Jacob. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. It was it was almost long overdue. It felt like it was overdue being uh, the title of your book fits so well with our show. So thank you so much. Hey guys, thanks once again to listening to today's episode of the Moonlight Graham Show. And even though I do most of the interviews here on the podcast, there is a ton of work that happens behind the scenes that you guys don't see that make each episode possible. So I got to give a shout out to the Moonlight Graham Show team. First of all, Brian Sandvig, our producer. Brian does all of the post-production work. And in real life, he's not just a podcast producer. He's also a real estate agent. So if you're looking to buy or sell a home, down in the Kansas or Missouri areas, give Brian Sandvig a call. Next guy on that list is Brendan Gargano. Brendan does all of our design and artwork here on the podcast. He's one of the most talented artists I've ever met, and I love all of his work. If you need any help on the design side with logos or anything like that, give Brendan Gargano a call. The next guy on that list is Andy Flattery, my older brother. Andy, of course, has done some of the of the interviews here on the podcast. He also is a certified financial planner. He owns a business called Simple Wealth Planning. If you need any help in that area, check Andy Flattery out. And then, of course, the trusty co-host, Tom Griffin, and my younger brother, Neil Flattery. Those guys are just busy being husbands, being fathers. They're family men, but also they do a ton of work here on the show. So thanks again for listening. We really appreciate you guys subscribing and supporting the Moonlight Graham Show.